Good morning. Thank you, Joe, for your introduction, and thank you all for being here. I also wish to echo Dave in my extreme gratitude to Father Mercier and Father Armstrong for your support of this project. Today, I'd like to share with you some of what my colleagues and I have found over the course of our research on the history of Jesuit slaveholding. So far, our work has focused primarily on understanding the lives of the families whom the Jesuits owned in the Missouri region. While we have learned some about the enslaved people who worked for the Jesuits in Bardstown and Lebanon, Kentucky, as well as in Louisiana, today I will speak mostly about slavery among the Jesuits in Missouri. Thus far, our research has encompassed the Missouri Province Collection here in the Jesuit Archives, the Historical Collection at the St. Louis University Archives, the Maryland Province Archives, the Archives of the Archdiocese of St. Louis, and local parishes, such as St. Ferdinand in Florissant. We have also examined city, state, and federal records, such as the freedom suits and freedom bonds of the St. Louis Circuit Court, draft records, and census records. There is still much more work to be done within these collections and many more. As with most historical work, moreover, we often have to revise our initial conclusions as we find new information. Some of what I may say here today, in other words, may change as the research continues. At this point, through extensive investigation into thousands of pages of documents, our research has determined that between 1823 and 1865, the Jesuits throughout the establishment of the Missouri Mission to what is now known as the Central and Southern Province owned, rented, or borrowed more than 150 enslaved individuals. Our work has sought to identify their names and understand what their lives were like. We have carefully compiled a list of every enslaved name we have found associated with the Jesuits, and we continue to add to it. From this list, we have begun genealogical work to identify descendants. Today, I want to share with you some of our findings which highlight specific emerging themes as we seek to understand the lives of the enslaved. I'll begin with the story of the initial three enslaved couples brought to Missouri from White Marsh, Maryland, a story perhaps familiar to you from a visit to Calvary Cemetery or Gilbert Garrigan's 1938 history on the Jesuits of the Middle United States. Three couples, Tom and Molly, sometimes called Polly Brown, Isaac and Susanna Hawkins, or Queen, and Moses and Nancy Queen, huddled together in a flatboat that at times drifted and at other moments careened down the Ohio River in May 1823. They had already walked on foot for a month as the rear guard of a hierarchically arranged band of 11 Jesuit priests, novices, and brothers along the approximately 273-mile mountainous terrain of the Cumberland Road from the Jesuits' White Marsh Plantation in Maryland to Wheeling, Virginia. They drove heavy wagons laden with the goods with which the Jesuits intended to found a new mission in the West. When the party reached the Ohio River, their master, Father Charles Van Quickenborn, hoping to spare the expense of taking a steamboat, ordered that two flatboats be lashed together by a double cord. Most could not swim, and none knew how to navigate the river. Rather than hire a pilot, Van Quickenborn purchased a river guidebook and commissioned Brother Strahan to navigate. <laughs> Treated as cargo themselves, Tom, Molly, Isaac, Susan, Moses, and Nancy sat in one overloaded flatboat, separated by a small partition wall from four horses and the baggage, while the Jesuits shared the other boat. The three couples clung to one another as the boats snagged on driftwood and were caught in trees. Isaac frequently came to the Jesuits' aid in rowing the group out of, the tr out of trouble when the boats drifted out of the current, especially at night. On one occasion, the small flotilla nearly collided with a passing steamboat. Jesuit Felix Verite, one of the novices on the journey, wrote in his account, a clamor arose from the slaves all jumped out of bed, awoken by the rapid striking together of the beams, and strongly agitated by the dim of the horses. All hurried to save their own lives until the calamity passed. On less eventful days, the enslaved passengers and their Jesuit masters saw little of one another. 
Barite commented, as they were good people, I do not doubt, they were saying their beads in a corner of their boat. We know some of what the Jesuits thought because they wrote it down. The thoughts of the enslaved were not recorded, but we can imagine that as they prepared meals for their masters and assisted in navigation, the three enslaved couples prayed, yearned for the family and community they left behind, and worried about the unknown future before them. Moses and Nancy must have grieved over their separation from their children, who remained in Maryland. All had left behind close relatives, including brothers and sisters. None knew whether they would ever see their families again. They must have dreamed of the freedom that was so close on the northern bank of the river they traversed. Once settled for several years at their destination in Missouri, Verite commented, we heard sometimes their earnest desire to be free in a free country. It was difficult, not to say almost impossible, to convince them of their happiness. <laughs> All rejoiced when the party landed at last in Shawneetown, Illinois, though the Bonds people's celebrations were fleeting. The conditions they left in Maryland were poor, their trip terrifying, and their new foreign situation promised to be difficult as well. The band walked on foot through Illinois, which had been a free state for fewer than five years, to St. Louis, where at the invitation of Bishop William Dubourg, they occupied a farm in Florissant, Missouri. The Jesuits took the farmhouse, while Tom, Molly, Moses, Nancy, Isaac, and Susan shared a cramped one-room cabin with no loft that also served as the kitchen and wash house. From this space, the three enslaved couples began to build the Jesuits' missionary outpost in the West. Susan prepared meals, and Molly and Nancy performed domestic work such as sewing and laundering. Moses served as a jack-of-all-trades, and along with others performed additional labor at night for pay, while the others began cultivating the farmland and hewed logs and stone to build new structures on the farm, which would eventually include the rock building that still stands today. As they worked the land and attended mass at the nearby St. Ferdinand Church, they encountered unfamiliar Creole populations of French, Spanish, Native American, and African heritage. Over time, their community grew by birth, marriage, purchase, and the arrival of more families from Maryland. On May 8, 1824, Isaac and Susan Hawkins gave birth to their first child, Peter, eventually known as Little Peter, who barely survived his birth. Little Peter was the first enslaved child born to the Jesuits and the enslaved people in Missouri, and one of the last of the formerly enslaved to remain with the Jesuits. He died at the Florissant Farm around 1907. The Jesuits' acquisition of additional enslaved people from Maryland shows a clear disregard for the Jesuit expectation of keeping families intact. In 1829, Father Van Quickenborn conveyed Protus and Annie Queen and Jack and Sally Queen and their children from Maryland to Missouri. Their arrival evoked a mixture of emotions. The Queens were related to most of the first six enslaved people who had helped found the mission in Missouri. Their reunion was bittersweet, however, because it also meant separation from brothers, sisters, and other family in Maryland many of whom were among the 272 enslaved people sold by the Jesuits in Maryland in 1838. In March 1848, Father James Vandeveld commented that he had been to visit the enslaved men and women in Louisiana, who he wrote have, quote, near relations, brothers, sisters, etc. at Florissant. He lamented that the bonds people with whom he had spoken had complained to him that they were not permitted time to practice their faith, that the nearest church was too far to visit regularly, and that there was no one around to provide religious instruction. Moses Queen and Isaac Hawkins, among others, frequently requested to go home to see their loved ones, but most were never to see their families again. Life as an enslaved person was never easy. We cannot measure the physical and mental toll bondage placed on enslaved individuals. Though the enslaved communities supported one another, 
Our research continues to show that the Jesuits enslaved laborers suffered from poor housing conditions, injuries and illness, beatings and separation from family. Both at St. Louis University and on the Florissant Farm, several Jesuit letters have admitted that the Jesuits were slow to have adequate homes built for the enslaved. <coughs> Jesuit father Peter Kenny, a visitor inspecting the mission in Missouri in 1832, reprimanded the Jesuits at St. Louis University for not providing separate chambers for each family or to separate unmarried men and women. The following year, one enslaved man, Thomas Brown, wrote of his living conditions to Jesuit father William McSherry in Maryland, complaining that he and his wife Molly, who had belonged to the Society of Jesus since birth, quote, live at present in a log house so old and decayed that at every blast of wind we are afraid of our lives, and such as it is, it belongs to one of the neighbors. He added that Jesuit father Peter Verhagen, the college rector, wanted them to live in the loft of an outbuilding that had no fireplace and was not properly insulated for the winter months. To save his family from dying of the winter cold, he offered to purchase their freedom for $100, stating that the amount was as much as our old bones are worth. The records we have uncovered do not tell us what became of Thomas after this point, but we know that Molly, who labored at Florissant, St. Louis University, and St. Francis Xavier College Church, died two decades later, still enslaved to the Society of Jesus. The rules of the Society of Jesus forbade the Jesuits from inflicting physical punishment on the enslaved. During his visitation in 1832, Father Peter Kenny warned the Jesuits that, quote, all ours, priests and non-priests, will understand that it is most strictly forbidden and solemnly forbidden them to inflict any species of corporal chastisement on a female slave, or even to threaten by word or act that they themselves will personally chastise them. However, the Jesuits were not above allowing corporal punishment, for Kenny continues his regulation with, quote, should correction ever become necessary, lay persons may be employed to do it. Neither are the priests to inflict corporal chastisement on the male servants, but this, when necessary, may be allowed to lay brothers who have authority over them. By this prohibition, priests are prevented from administering to anyone corporal chastisement, however well deserved, which could be considered severe punishment. But though they should as much as possible ever abstain from an act so little convenient to their sacred character, it is not here intended to interdict that slight correction which is sometimes necessary to be given to boys and youths who are not yet 21 years of age. Despite these regulations against beatings, the Jesuits still physically chastised their bonds people. Father Van Quickenborn was notorious among his fellow Jesuits for being harsh toward the enslaved, who took to calling him Napoleon because of his severe demeanor. He was criticized several times for spending too much time in the fields aggravating the enslaved and provoking conflict, and being too quick to punish Bond's people with beatings or the threat of sale. In a letter to Father Verhagen, Father Peter de Smet complains that the beatings and, quote, quarrels and fights of priests and blacks had grown so, bla so bad that more than 12 boys who were attending the St. Regis Indian School, many of whom had suffered whippings themselves, had run away. Nevertheless, Van Quickenborn refused to ease his treatment. The enslaved at times complied to avoid further mistreatment, but at other times resisted. On one occasion, Van Quickenborn called a novice to whip one of the bondsmen. When the novice raised his hand to administer the beating, the man's wife threw herself in front of the whip, flinging her arms around her husband and thus preventing the beating. At another point, when Van Quickenborn called upon the novices to punish a slave, the novices refused to interfere. They asked a neighbor to administer the whipping, but when he arrived on the farm, many of the enslaved women began looking for stones to hurl at him. According to one novice, quote, seeing the danger he was in, the neighbor took to his heels, jumped the fence, and was since never seen about the premises. 
Enslaved people were subject to separation from their families at the whims of masters, and the Jesuits were no excep exception. On May 2, 1830, Father de Smet in Florissant wrote to Father Verhagen at St. Louis College, expressing his dismay that Van Quickenborn had sold a bondsperson named Peter. Father de Smet wrote, I explained his case to our good and tender-hearted Father Provincial, and I have reasons to believe it prevented the selling of others. His poor parents, however, constantly lament his loss, and the people are far from being happy and satisfied. On September 7, 1830, Father Verhagen wrote to Superior General Jan Rotan, stating among many issues regarding the treatment of enslaved people, that Van Quickenborn had become so deeply embroiled into a conflict with two enslaved women that Verhagen had to intervene before he got hurt. Van Quickenborn had so greatly upset the Bonds people that he was afraid to sleep in his own room at night and kept watch at his door. He claims that a 17-year-old enslaved boy had threatened to kill him and subsequently had him sold, though no other Jesuit had heard the threat. On January 16, 1831, Father de Tu wrote to Rotan, stating that Van Quickenborn, quote, has greatly aggravated, I believe unjustly, our Negroes. He commanded thereafter four of them to go up to the prison in St. Louis, being forced away to be sold publicly. And on the way, at the persuasion of our temporal coadjutor de Meyer, they begged pardon and were sent back to their own. Due to the complaints submitted against Van Quickenborn concerning these sales, Maryland Superior Francis Girozinski insisted that Van Quickenborn, quote, solicit his express permission before disposing of any slaves belonging to the mission. In addition to physical castigation, the Jesuits utilized emotional means to punish their enslaved. In 1832, the Jesuits purchased a man named Peter from Louis Barada of St. Charles. He became known as Big Peter to differentiate him from the younger Peter at Florissant. In December 1843, he married Marion, who belonged to Major Richard Graham. Between 1845 and 1849, Peter and Marion had at least three children, Elizabeth, Gabriel, and Thomas William. However, in 1849, the Jesuits transferred Peter to Bardstown, Kentucky, supposedly because he was stirring up trouble among fellow slaves. With the money from Peter's sale, the Jesuits purchased Mary Hoppins, widow of their slave Gabriel, Gabriel Queen and present wife of their bondsperson Augustine Queen. One family was brought together by the separation of another. The Jesuits in Bardstown sold Peter away a few weeks later. Peter, torn from his wife and children, left behind money he had earned to provide for Marion's welfare once he was gone. We do not know if the family was ever reunited again. In spite of ill treatment, the Jesuits bonds people were, re were resilient. The Hawkins and Queen families descended from an extended family network of active freedom seekers who sued for their freedom in the courts of Washington, D.C. Several queens sustained this agency in Missouri. One woman, Matilda Tyler, believed to be the daughter of Protus and Annie Queen, one of the families brought from Maryland in 1829, and a slave of St. Louis University, purchased her own freedom and that of five of her children between 1849 and 1859. The money for her freedom went to St. Francis Xavier College Church, where Matilda and her family were parishioners. One year later, Matilda Tyler went to the same church whose operation was funded in part by the price of her freedom and received the sacrament of confirmation. What did it mean for Matilda to earn her freedom? And what does it mean for the Jesuits to use the money she gave in this way? What did Matilda's faith mean to her that she remained a member of the very church that profited from her bondage? Matilda Tyler and her family utilized the kin, faith, and community networks they had forged on the Missouri frontier to carve out meaningful lives despite their enslavement. They remained active members of St. Francis Xavier College Church and later St. Elizabeth's Parish for generations. Many are buried in Calvary Cemetery. 
Thus far, we have successfully traced the descendants of Matilda Tyler's son, Charles, to 1965. As we move forward with this project, we cannot forget that the labor of enslaved people in the new mission territory supported the growth of the Jesuit order, who became one of the largest slaveholders in the region. Bond's people were at the center of the running of the Jesuits' parishes, their missions to Native Americans and settlers in the West, as well as the development of their institutions of higher learning, including those established in the North. This is a story that does not end in 1865. Many of the formerly enslaved remained Catholic and stayed in the St. Louis area after they became free. If they hadn't, we would not have had as much, as, as much success as we've already had at tracing descendants. How many of Matilda Tyler's descendants, or Peter Queen's descendants, are still part of this community and perhaps associated with the apostolic works of the Society of Jesus now? How do we account for the membership of descendants in parishes, schools, and other institutions that were supported in their earliest years by the unfree labor of these descendants' ancestors, institutions which Jesuits continue to operate today? We must keep this history in mind as, through the Slavery, History, Memory, and Reconciliation Project, we seek reconciliation and begin dialogue about how we can make amends today. As I continue my work with this project, I realize there are always more questions than there are answers. This project is ongoing and there is still so much to learn. I look forward to conversations with you about your questions, connections, and ideas both today and in the future as we endeavor to grapple, as we endeavor to grapple with this difficult history. Thank you. <laughs>